And I certainly thank God for everyone. I want to go into my assignment that was given to me, um, Acts 6 and 3. And then we're going to go to John, the 14th chapter. And Acts 6 and 3, we'll get that right quick and read it for you. He says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you. Seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. That's our theme. Then I want to go to John 14. In the 15 verses, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither know him, but Ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. My assignment was the Holy Spirit is to the believer what training is to an athlete or runner. When I thought about this particular theme, verse 17 jumped out at me in that last clause. For he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. One of the things that I had, a motto I had during football practice, if I can get it in you, it will never leave you. And I want to talk a little bit from that. Father, we thank you for your word and we give you praise on and glory touch these lips of clay of mine that I may speak that which become it sound doctrine into the ears of these men of God Lord I thank you Lord as I decrease allow the spirit of the Lord to speak and let the word fall on good ground that they that may hear the word may bring forth fruit I want to talk for one minute the importance of the Holy Spirit. The great G.E. Patterson made this particular statement concerning the importance of the Holy Spirit. So when the Spirit of God is operating in the church or when the Spirit of God is operating in the confines of the church, people that are saved and have the Holy Ghost understand that they have rules and operate within the confines of the rules. Say that again. They have rules and they operate within the confines of the rules. That's when people have the Holy Ghost. And when we understand that even with all of our innovative ideas, even the things that we discuss, as Dr. Leake said before we go into the boardroom, to talk about the business of the church and the things that we will incorporate in our day-to-day -day activity, we need to go back to square one. The first step to Christian discipleship is that a man must first deny himself. When a man learn to deny himself, he will begin to understand the importance that the scriptures points out to the spirit of God. Our leader alluded to yesterday concerning 
the Holy Spirit. I didn't have the pleasure like uh, Pastor Woodard had had listened to the message three times, but I, I, I had another assignment. I've listened to I Am Forgiven three times, but I do have it on my phone. But um, I thank the Lord that he pointed out to us that even before now, the scripture in the beginning already stated how important the spirit of God is. And he said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. And darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. And he used the word move and he translated and said the word move means to hover over. Means to hover over before God began to do his work of his creation. It was the spirit of God hovering over the earth that was bored without form. And the whole of the universe God created in the presence of the Holy Ghost. My son Christian is here. Christian, stand up for a second. That's my, my baby. Amen. Christian squats about 700 pounds. Almost bench, almost 500 pounds. He broke every record at his high school and during Christian years of 17 and 18, Christian had long hair and it's very curly, you know, wild. And so he would come to me before the game and I would pray for him. And when I prayed for him, I said, Lord, bless my son with the strength of Samson. I said, his hair is long and He's strong. So bless him with the strength of Samson. And in reading the Bible about Samson, I thought that basically that Samson's strength was in his hair. And oftentimes you heard the story of what happened with Samson. But when we look at the scripture closely, Samson's strength was not in his hair. His hair was only a symbol of the fact that he had not broken his vow. Judges 13 and 3 says, Remember when the angel of the Lord came and told the man who would be the father of Samson that he and his wife were going to have a child. Verse 4 and 5 says, Now therefore beware, I pray thee, drink not wine, nor strong drink. Eat not any unclean thing. For lo, thou shalt conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come on his head, for the child shall be called a Nazareth from God unto the womb. So he told him not to drink strong drink. And no razor shall come upon his head. For the sake of time, in Judges 4, 14, 5, and 6, the Bible says when Samson went with his parents to find his wife in Timnath, Scripture says a young lion roared against him. And Samson rent him as though he were rent a kid. But the scripture never said that Samson had anything in his hand. Before he, the scripture tells you, he rent the line. If you look at verse 6, the scripture says, in the spirit of the Lord came upon him. And you will see in each of Samson encountering right. with trouble. Right. Every time he got into trouble, the scripture says the spirit of the Lord 
came upon him. Verse 19 says, And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he went down to Ashkelon and slew 30 men of them, took their spoil, and gave change of garments unto them which expounded the riddle. And his anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. So before he had a great demonstration and display of strength, we see that the scripture denotes that the spirit of God moved on him. So his strength was not in his hair. His strength was in the spirit of the Lord. Now when did Samson lose this? When did he lose it? After he went to Delilah and told her his secret. Man, he put his head in her lap. She shaved his head. And then she called for the Philistine to be upon Samson. In Judges 16 and 20. And Samson got up and said, I will get up and shake myself as like other times. But when heaven looked down on him and saw that he has broken his vow, the spirit of God didn't come and he did not have the power to rescue himself. Now, the church without the spirit is just like Samson. A lot of people are shaking themselves. But when they get through shaking, nothing happens. Because the Holy Ghost is not there. And when the Holy Ghost is not there to do the work, we have a lot of substitute things happening. Men of God, we need the divine activity of the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We need his presence to convict us of sin. We need his presence to permanently indwell us while at Superintendent Gates Church in Asheville. Our bishop preached a message calling us to attention in seeking the Lord that he calling us to a place of accountability. I was there and Dr. Wilson was there and we were sitting on the pulpit and my wife was sitting in the audience and he made a statement. It caused me to Look within my heart in myself. And I spoke to James. I said, change. The spirit of the Lord is speaking. Hear ye him. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. And he said we have caused a lot of the things in our own lives. To not move like God wants them to move because we are distracted by everything else. And we are not hearing what God is seeing. Went to the hotel. I told God, I said, honey, I fell on my knees. And I began to understand the importance of what I've done for 15 years. As a coach and an athlete. It's very important that we stay conditioned and trained if we're going to accomplish any results, if we're going to meet any desire. It is our due diligence in the same way if we hope to accomplish what God desires in our lives, we need to see him, the Holy Ghost as our source 
in our power, yes, in our strength. Yes. Most of us watch Olympics on TV. And we have watched as the athletes compete in all sorts of contests. Regardless of the area of competition, every athlete has to pay a high price to get to the Olympics. One of the things that you must encounter and you must own is that you must become totally committed to the cause. The Olympia is total committed to the cause. The average Olympia trains four hours a day, at least 310 days out of a year before succeeding in respect to competition. They get a lot done before the hour of 7 a.m. Every day is training. Going out to the practice field and running the course over and over, building his stamina and strength. These people also have a healthy diet. They watch what's going inside their mouth. They watch what they do with their body because they know that in order to be able to compete, they got to be competitive. How well an athlete performs is often attributed to mental toughness. But the performance really depends on the physical capacity to do the work. Athletes, when they begin to train, competing for a championship prize, they don't start the competition at the moment the gun signs for the race to win, run. They begin their preparation. Many weeks, years in advance. They have a dream, a desire to succeed, but they know in order for them to succeed and victory to come, there must be a daily striving for the prize. They can't forget even for one day that they must pay the price if they are to be competitive. Paul on several his occasion used sports as an example of the Christian life. During the current time and during the games, we see Paul alluded to the scriptures and bringing light to what it means for an individual to receive or go after a crown and receive the glory for the discipline that he done. I want to pause here for a minute. I was in Williamsburg, Virginia with my mothers. And it was on a Thursday night. I would take my mothers on a rendezvous every year. And I was down there and I told Gold, I says, honey, look, you're going to have to take care of the mothers for a few hours. I got to get back to Raleigh because I got to hear a word from the Lord. I have to see my dad tonight. There is something that God is speaking to me. When I got there that night, I remember calling Elder Williams, and I said, Elder Williams, I got to turn around and go back, but I got to get here because I know in respect to what I need. I needed a word from the Lord. And many times when I look at even the training and the things that I've done as a coach and the things that I took the kids through mentally and physically, the main focus, as I forestated, was to get something in them so it'll never leave them. In that particular night, our bishop was preaching 1 Corinthians 9, 24 and 27. He says, no, you're not. That they that run in a race, all but one receive it, the prize. So run that you may obtain every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate 
in all things. He says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we do it for an incorruptible crown. And I remember the promise I made to my mother when she passed. I was going to work to the lab and I saw as I was walking down the sidewalk and before I entered the lab, I looked up and I said to my mama, she was gone for about five days. I said, mama, I'll see you again. When I told my mother that I would see her again, the trees, there was no wind blowing, but the trees just began to just move. I went on into work and I said to myself, these words, I therefore so run, not as uncertainty. I have my focus on where I'm going. I know that I have to train with everything I got. So four and a half hours was nothing for me to be able to hear in the dispense of my training to get where I need to go. So I don't fight as I'm beating the air. I'm not shadow boxing. I know what my mark is. I know what I got to do. I know that in respect to my passion for heaven, I said I got to keep my body, bring it into subjection. Lest by any means when I preach to others, I myself might be a castaway. Now my bishop brought light to this. He said that's not so much about heaven, but it's about right now. And I understood what he was saying because he said to me, James, preach to others, but don't you be disqualified. So I knew that I had to take and fight and continue to train. And my training involves sitting at the feet of my leader on Thursday night, every opportunity that I get, if he's in Greensboro, I'm going. If he's in Asheboro, I'm going. If he's in Spottenburg, I'm going. If he's in Asheville, I'm going. Because before me, as an athlete, must train. I run, I'm running a marathon. I don't know when it's over, but I know one thing. I'm training. To make it. So we see that the Apostle Paul made this statement to them. And as so for the Christian, we are in a race. We're in a race, and what we need is something more powerful than us. Look at your neighbor says, as Dr. Lee said, we need the Holy Ghost. But we don't only need the Holy Ghost. We need the spirit of truth. We need the spirit of truth to cause us to be able to make right decisions. As a pastor, I was sharing with uh, Dr. Nichols one day concerning my ministry. I said to him, man of God, my ministry has not always been small. I said my ministry was very large. But when the spirit, and this is why it's so important, men of God, you that are starting out on your churches, when the spirit of the Lord takes a flight, when things begin to happen and you don't deal with those things in respect to discipline and training. I remember telling my bishop certain things and he spoke to me and the Lord, my God, resolved in my spirit. He told me the thing that I had to do because what happened was I got distracted with coaching. I got distracted, my God, watching the football team. We went to almost four state championships, but it consumed my time. While I was there in the classroom, my church was falling apart. And I remember the early days of my ministry. I used to hang out with my leader going to the movies in my early days. But for about the span of about 10 to 12 years, I was there at that football field. Sunday mornings, my time was looking at film at 5 o'clock in the morning, leaving there, going to church at 8.30, teaching leadership class. 
that wasn't good, but the Lord taught me one of the greatest lessons. He taught me the lesson and said, you can't serve two masters. The Holy Ghost will not undergird what you're doing unless you totally commit to me. Unless you give everything to me, you're not going to be able to be successful in this. So my God, I begin to now take the right role. I begin to understand what it means as an athlete in training. I had to get back up because now I see that my own Olympic game is before me. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to run and I'm going to allow the things before me because I realize what Paul told the Galatians. Who did hinder you that you didn't run well? I can't let nothing hinder me. I can't let anything get in my way. I don't mean to knock you over when I'm trying to get to my leader, but my God, I'm trying to get to my passion. There's a word in his belly. If he can get it in me, it'll never. The Holy Ghost will bring the truth of God that it will change your whole decorum and your passion. You won't sit in your office. You won't sit in your church. You won't look at the things and allow them to distract you because you got purpose. You got purpose now because why? God has given you something greater than you ever can imagine. He says, not only would I be with you, but I will be in you. In you. In you. In you. While on the sideline running the defense, I was the head coach, but I wouldn't let my defense let anybody run it. So while on the sideline, I looked over and I saw one of my players and I said, what's in you? That's what I want you to do. I trained you all week for this particular play. I was watching their offense and how they were set up, and I knew that this play was getting ready to be run. I needed my wheel linebacker to take and blitz the A gap and blow them up. I said, what I have already put in you, that's what I need you to do. There's something about the Holy Ghost. When it's time to come forth, when it's time to do the will of God, when it's time to persevere in a trial, what the Lord has put in you, it will never leave you. The truth of God will trump every false lie. The truth of God will bring everything down. The truth of God will bless you beyond measure. My God, saints of God and friends of mine, the Holy Ghost to the believer is what training is to an athlete.